Hello, everyone, and welcome to our new seminar for the Spring 2022 Clever Planet Seminar Series. My name is Maxime Maurice. I'm a postdoc at Rice University, and that's my great pleasure today to be your host for the um, seminar that will be given by Karin Oberg. And before I introduce uh, Karin, I'd like to proceed to our little ritual where I will tell you a few words about the Clever Planet project. So the Clever Planet project is a multi-institutional interdisciplinary initiative to unravel the conditions of planetary uh, habitability in our solar system and beyond. Its lead institution is Rice University and it is supported by NASA. It is also one of the teams of the Nexus for Exoplanetary Science System Coordination Network under astrobiology. And I would also like to acknowledge that the research that we are doing at Rice University, which is hosting this online seminar, is pursued on the traditional territory of several native people, namely the Karankawas and Sanas, as well as the Kohawiltekan, represented today by the Tapilam Kohawiltekan Nation, and the Aishaks, represented today by the Atakapa Aishak Nations. We see as our duty to acknowledge this historical aspect of our identity and to foster a beneficial environment for all communities, in particular those who preceded us on this land. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce you to the speaker, Professor Kai Noberg, who's a professor of astronomy at Harvard University. Her path through cosmochemistry began with, at least uh, academically speaking, um, with her undergrad at Caltech in chemistry. She then relocated to the old world where she did a PhD at Leiden University on, in the department of um, astronomy, working on interstellar ices. She then received a NASA Hubble postdoc fellowship to go at um, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, where she is a professor since 2013. And today, Kain will, to will talk about chemistry of plant formation. And so with that, please, Kain, take it away. Thank you, Maxime. And uh, thank you for the whole, to the whole Clever team for this invitation. So, Hopefully you should be seeing my presentation, which is where I will be spending the next 45 minutes uh, talking about how chemistry impacts plant formation. Uh, before getting into uh, this topic, uh, I do want to acknowledge that this work uh, is only possible because a large number of mostly junior people, so students and postdocs that have done amazing uh, work, um, both within my group and as collaborators, uh, as well as the funding resources that we have received uh, from different organizations. But back uh, to the topic, uh, as one might um, assume uh, within this uh, Clever Planet series, uh, the things that's in the back of my head when doing, uh, when doing research is on the one hand, uh, thinking about our own home at the earth. Uh, how this planet might have ended up uh, the way it did. So to understand our own history, our own solar system history. But then of course, we know now that our planetary system is just one of, of many. And that's being able to predict how often we get systems that are similar or different compared to one that we have is a, is a really exciting prospect that I'm very happy uh, to be part of. And this really, like to answer either of those questions, really comes down to understanding the environment within which planets form, which are these disks of dust and gas around young stars, where the kind of molecules you have around uh, is really what sets the composition uh, of the planets that are forming, both their overall composition, so how much of each element that they have, as well as their uh, potential habitability. So do they have the right kind of molecules uh, to host their own audience of life? There are a number of different avenues that you could study these disks and try to figure out what the, what the chemistry uh, of planet formation is like. Uh, 
uh, and I'm going to go through several of them. And I want to start with sort of a historical or inheritance kind of approach. So these disks emerge uh, as a part of uh, star formation. So if you look at the how, how a star like our sun forms, right? A solar system like our solar system forms, it begins with these large interstellar clouds. So dust and gas uh, over densities in the interstellar medium, uh, which begin to collapse in on themselves and to preserve angular momentum, you get a, a disk. Uh, and once everything else, all other, uh, all other material has cleared, accreted onto the star, been blown away, what you're left with is this protoplanetary disk uh, within which planets are forming. And th I mean, that's the one we really want to understand. But a lot of the composition of this disk depends on the chemistry and physics that preceded it. So if we start all the way to the left, looking at this, uh, at our cloud, at our collapsing cloud, um, the chemistry there is primarily set by a balance between photochemistry on the one hand, and photo particularly photodissociation, and how fast you can form new molecules um, both in the gas phase and on the surfaces of grains. And as you get uh, further and further from the edge of the cloud, so deeper and deeper in, uh, the balance shifts from things being quickly dissociated to things being formed. And also at the same, at the same time, both the gas and the grains get colder. You can form more and more things uh, on the surfaces of grains, so forming different kinds of ices. There are many things here you could talk about, but I just want to point out uh, a couple of things, uh, which is that uh, because of the way that the gas chemistry works, um, the gas and grain chemistry works in these clouds, uh, a lot of the carbon uh, goes quickly into the carbon monoxide or CO in these clouds. Um, most of the remaining oxygen goes into forming water on grains. And most of that, uh, that um, green surface water stays on the grains, forming a water ice. And most of the nitrogen, we think, uh, goes into forming N2. Uh, so this means that long before we start forming planets, we have already moved these really important, biogenically very important elements into specific carriers uh, that is going to matter for the future uh, chemical uh, trajectory. Uh, based on both observations and theory and solar system observations, um, like solar system missions, we have some idea of what the, the budget, the oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen budgets, what they are at the onset of star and planet formation. Uh, importantly, as I already said, a lot of the oxygen is in CO and water. Uh, most of the carbon is in CO or in refractory grains. And while we can't see most of the nitrogen, we think that most of it is in molecular uh, nitrogen. Uh, we have good reasons to think that a lot of these initial carriers survive all the way into forming planets. One of the pieces of evidence we have of that comes from looking at the deuterium uh, fractionation of water, one of these important uh, water carriers uh, in our own solar system. So whether we look in comets or in uh, water here on Earth, uh, we see that we have quite a lot of heavy water. That's water that has a deuteron instead of hydrogen attached to it. And the only way we really know of forming that much of this heavy water uh, is in the course of molecular clouds. And that means that a lot of the water that formed in these clouds actually survived all the different uh, stages uh, from, from the cloud all the way to forming a planet. So when we're thinking about what sets the chemical environment of plant formation, at least some of it is set or at this earliest uh, cloud stage. We also have good reason to think that some of the organic inventory is set very early on. Uh, there's uh, a really cool result uh, by Alice Booth and collaborators from last year which showed that they had a lot of methanol uh, in a very, warm, uh, a very warm disk. Now, this is interesting because the only way we know to form a lot of methanol is at very low temperatures by adding hydrogen to CO ice. So if we're seeing a lot of methanol in a warm place, it means it's coming from somewhere else. And the most obvious explanation is that this is water 
that again formed in the molecular cloud or at least in the collapsing cloud core uh, and then became incorporated into this protoplanetary disk. And if it became incorporated into one disk, we think it probably becomes incorporated much more generally, including in our own solar system. So not just things like water, but also the most basic organics uh, very likely uh, form very early on in the star and planet formation process. Once we move on from the early collapse to the later protostellar stage, this middle panel here, uh, some new chemistry becomes possible because you're starting to heat things up. And zooming in on this stage, um, when you heat up initially cold uh, interstellar grains, a couple of things happen at once. You do lose some of the icy mantle, the most volatile uh, part into the gas phase, uh, but also you start enabling the moving around or diffusion of atoms and radicals and molecules in these icy mantles. And that really allows you to kickstart a very complex organic chemistry. Uh, these uh, complex organic molecules uh, can then be returned into the gas phase uh, close to the protostar, either because of passive heating or because of different kinds of shocks. But the ones that do not get into the gas phase through these different kinds of processes should become incorporated into the nascent disk. So at the time when you are forming your protoplanetary disk, we think it's forming not just with water, not just with simple organics, but with this very rich organic chemistry already in place. Um, the disk itself, uh, oh, sorry, and I should say that the reason we know of many of these organic molecules is that we do see them. Uh, we see this very complex spectra towards protostars. They're extremely rich uh, in a lot of these complex organic molecules. So by the time we arrive at the disk, we have this whole heritage of molecules and chemistry that we need to take into account if we want to predict the composition of a nascent, uh, of a nascent planet. Uh, and, um, and when thinking about that though, we can't just assume that this is it, that by the time we get to the disk stage, all we're doing is taking this initial and inheritance of molecules, just placing them at the right, like uniformly across the disk, and that's it to, uh, to interpret what is the molecular environment that planets form in. And the reason we think we cannot do just that is that disks have this really interesting dynamical and chemical structures all on their own. So this is a cartoon of what we think a disk is like, both dynamically and chemically. Uh, so we do have uh, both dynamical and sort of structural properties of disks, which uh, will move around or at least move things between the gas and, and the solid phase of the things that were already inherited uh, from these earlier phases. Uh, perhaps most importantly, we have so-called sublimation or condensation lines, which is going to determine if things like waters, mainly in grains or in the gas phase, um, we have the movement of grains and gas, which is going to transport molecules from one place of, uh, in the disk to another, uh, both vertically and radially. But we also have surfaces of disks which are very exposed to radiation from the star. Um, and we would expect that that's going to lead to the production of another generation of molecules that could be used both to understand what the disk is like, so what the dynamics uh, um, and the sort of radiation environment of these disks are like, but also that might affect the composition of nascent planets uh, if we have circulation between the upper and the deeper layers of the disk. Now, how can we uh, go about actually testing these ideas of this rich uh, inventory and these sort of redistributions of molecules and new productions of molecules in disks? Well, one way is to look at them uh, and to observe disks. Right now, the best tool we have uh, is ALMA, this beautiful telescope in the Atacama Desert, which has the resolution and also operates at the, the right wavelength uh, to observe molecules uh, in disks. Uh, one thing like 
so, so what we're going to, I'm going to be talking about the next at least 20 minutes or so is how we have been using ELMA to really map out uh, where, which molecules are where uh, in these planet forming uh, disks. The way that we do it is that if you're thinking um, about the light that we get from disks, it's basically a thermal continuum and on top of which we have uh, emission lines. Now, if you integrate over a large swath uh, of this uh, continuum, you will get uh, gorgeous images uh, like this. Um, this is from, from d -Shart, just showing the thermal emission uh, uh, from, from a disk. But if you isolate uh, the wavelengths that correspond to a single molecule, uh, then you can get an image of just where, a where the emission from a certain molecule in, uh, in this disk. So this is what we have done uh, within the ALMA large program maps. Uh, so this was a large program, not just in the number of hours, but also in the team that was involved in realizing it. And I do wanna call out both my uh, PI, uh, PI colleagues, as well as the large team of, again, mostly junior people who did amazing work to bring the ALMA observations into really interesting science, uh, only a fraction of which I will have time uh, to show you here. So what we did with ALMA was to focus on uh, five disks. Uh, and for these five disks, we looked at um, a little bit more than 20 molecular lines uh, at the two, in two different wavelength bands. So we could get some idea about excitation as well as just the mission from uh, individual, uh, individual lines. And what it looks like, or at least what about half of the data looks like is this. So these are our five disks in the dust emission. And these are the same five disks in about 20, uh, 20-ish uh, molecular lines that we got from, from maps. So in the, the, so the blue, uh, the blue disk are showing different molecular lines, their distribution, uh, and each disk uh, is, a different, is a different row uh, in this image. So when you have this wealth of data, it's very high resolution molecular data towards protoplanetary disks, there's a number of really interesting questions that you can, uh, that you can start to answer that are really trying to understand what the environment within which the planets are forming, uh, what that is like. Um, one of them is that you can at least begin to, to check how does the chemical or molecular substructure compare to the, the dust substructure, the structure that we see in the thermal emission from dust. Reasons you might want to understand that is that we think a lot of this dust substructure is caused by planet formation, uh, including uh, some of these dark lanes that we see here. Um, may very well be where planets are right now forming a creeping material. Uh, so we would like to know uh, what the chemical environment is like inside of these you know, gaps, these dust gaps. And are these dust caps in part caused by chemical considerations? Um, or can we tell what kind of chemical composition a planet will have that form in this kind of gap? Those would be some of the typical questions we would like to answer. Um, as you might be able to tell already from this overview picture, we do see structure in the molecular emission. Uh, I think it's a little bit easier uh, to see if we uh, zoom in on like one of the molecules, uh, perhaps the one that's the most commonly observed, uh, that is CO. So this uh, shows just CO data towards the five disks. So each of the columns uh, is a different disk and each of the rows here uh, is a different CO isotopologue. So CO, 13 CO, C8, you know, uh, and so on. And what you can see emerging here with CO, which we think should mainly be tracing what the gas is doing, is that it's not uniformly distributed. There is some structure to it. And we can try to compare this uh, with what's going on in the dust. And this is exactly what Coco Zhang did as a part of the, of the MAPS project. And here is one of her sort of main results. 
So what you're seeing in the darker color is where dust gaps are in these five disks, and the lighter blue color is where we're seeing a gap in the CL, supposedly due to a gap in the gas. The relationship even for the simplest of molecules uh, is somewhat complex. If we look at this inner parts of the disk, or at least the innermost gaps, like we do seem to always see a gap in the CO or gap in the gas when we have a gap in the dust. But in the outer parts of the disk, it's not clear at all that this correlation continues. We don't know yet exactly what this is. Um, it could be that you have different kinds of planets carving out different kinds of gaps. Or maybe the CO chemistry is not as easy as we thought and doesn't trace the gas uh, as well as we often, often assume or at least hope that it does. So I think there's some really interesting both chemical as well as the planet formation dynamical questions uh, that are opening up as a result of this, uh, of this work. Um, CO actually shows some of the least substructure though of the molecules that we were looking at. If we look at one of the disks, um, HD163296, and we compare what we see in CO compared to four of the other molecules, CO actually looks pretty mundane. When we look at things like hydrogen cyanide or C2H or HC3N, we see a lot more substructure with up to four rings in the, cage, uh, in, in the case of HCN. So when we're thinking about these molecules that seem to be doing more than just tracing the gas, um, what are they caused by? A first way to look at this is to compare how this chemical substructure, uh, how that compares with the dust substructure, just as we did for CL. Uh, the way that uh, Charles Law visualized that is what you see here. So first of all, you have in the background, uh, so going so in the x-axis going uh, is the radius of this disk of one of the disks. In the background, uh, you see the dust. Uh, so where you see darker lanes, there is there are dust gaps. Where you see brighter colors, there is a dust ring. And then you see the circles, uh, which are uh, a gap in the in a molecular emission, and the squares. Uh, which are uh, a ring. Uh, so with this kind of images, we can start to see some, uh, some correlations between what's going on in the dust and what's going on uh, with the chemistry. So some of the time, uh, we do see that the, a gap in the dust corresponds to a gap uh, in many of the molecular emission. So maybe here we're just seeing missing gas where we're seeing um, missing dust similar to how we can interpret some of the, the CO structure maybe. But there are also times when we, see, uh, when, we, when we see a gap in the dust, but we actually see a ring in most of the molecules. This is a bit more curious. Like why would you have excess chemistry where you have a depletion of dust and perhaps also some depletion of the gas? Uh, this is not a solved problem, but some ideas are that maybe where you are losing dust, you have more UV light penetrating deeper into the disk. And that is allowing you to really kickstart some interesting photochemistry that might lead to this rings in molecular emission. Uh, you, we also see a uh, substructure in molecular emission in the chemistry that we don't see and that we don't see any structure in the dust at all. Um, all this together is suggesting that there are uh, many kinds of origins of chemical substructure, especially since we do see this mix of correlations and anti-correlations with dust and also no correlations with dust across all five disks uh, as is shown here. Uh, so there's a lot of work uh, here left to do to figure out what are then the origins of specific chemical substructure. But I think what is emerging very clearly is that there's not going to be a single answer uh, to that, that we are going to really have to do the hard work of modeling our disk, sometimes individually, or at least modeling the chemistry in sort of a very targeted way uh, to try to understand where these correlations and anti-correlations and non-correlations come from. The second thing that the MAPS data 
allows us to do is to look not just in the radial dimension, but also to look at what's going on uh, vertically. Uh, so when we're looking at dust with ALMA, we rarely see any um, vertical sort of dimension. The, the dust emission is really coming from very close to the midplane. Uh, but we know from uh, some earlier ALMA observations of CO, as well as from uh, observations of smaller dust that's in the surfaces, emits from the surfaces of the disk or reflects light at the surfaces of the disk. Uh, but these disks do have uh, a vertical structure as well that we should be able to see uh, very well with the resolution that we have with, with maps. Um, this may be the easiest to see actually, not when we look at the complete maps that I've been showing you so, so far, but when we split up these images into individual as a velocity bins, which is what we have done here. I'm not gonna go through exactly how this kind of channel maps, how they work. All I want you to do is to focus on one of the channels where we're looking at the very narrow you know, wavelength bin and isolating the mission from that. And then you can actually here see both the front and the back of the disk. And you can see that there is some angle between them. Uh, and this is the height. Uh, this gives us an idea what the height of the emitting layers are within the disk. Uh, we can do this for all five disks and in the different C isotopologues that we have. The reason that you want to look at this with different kinds of C isotopologues, so 12 CO, 13 CO, C18 now, is we expect the rarer isotopologues to be more and more optically thin and therefore emit deeper and deeper from deeper and deeper into the disk. And this is also something that we see when we look again at these individual channels. Uh, it looks like the disk flattens uh, as we go to the rarer uh, isotopologues. We can use uh, these multiple isotopologues to map out the structures, the vertical structures uh, of, of the disk. So if it just takes the isolate the pixels here from these disks and uh, determine what height they're emitting from, uh, what you get is a pretty elevated uh, CO, uh, 12 CO emitting layer. So it's just plotting the disk height versus the disk radius in arc seconds. Um, 13 CO that's coming from deeper into the midplane, so it looks flatter. And C18 now, that's very flat indeed. And this is, I mean, exactly what you could see just by eye when looking at the, at the channel maps. But what's really cool is that you can also use, use the line strengths uh, of these different is isotopolog, uh, isotopologues to say something about what the temperature of the disk is like. We think most of the CO, 13 CO, and C18 emission should be optically thick. And that means that the line intensity depends on uh, really just on the gas temperature uh, within which CO is emitting. And we can then use that to tell what the temperature of the disk is. Is it different uh, disk heights and disk radii, giving empirical maps of, of the temperature distributions in disks, which is really important. This is what it looks like more quantitatively for our five uh, disks, again, from Charles Law. This is really important when we try to predict uh, planet formation, both how efficiently planets form at different uh, parts of the disks, uh, as well as what their possible compositions could be, since the latter also depends on the temperature and therefore what elements are available in the gas phase and on the grains that the planets are forming from. Uh, moving more into sort of chemical or at least elemental concerns, another thing that the MAPS data allows us to do is to start constraining what the gas phase, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur abundances are as a function of radius, or at least their relative ratios. When we um, picture one of these disks, what we think should be going on um, is that as you step away from the central star, the midplane of the disk will get colder and colder and colder, which means that more and more volatile carriers of elements will be freezing out. 
because the main carriers of different vol of different elements like oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen have different volatilities, this will lead to different elemental composition on the gas uh, in the gas as well as on dust as you step away uh, from the star. Uh, this is something you can try to quantify, making some uh, very big simplifications. Particularly one set of simplifications you can make is that you have no chemistry in the disk, you just inherit whatever was made in the pre-stellar uh, phase, this uh, budgets that I showed you before. And then you just distribute them in the disk according to the sublimation temperatures of these different carriers. If you do this, you can then predict what the carbon to oxygen ratio should be in the gas and the dust, as well as the nitrogen to oxygen ratio in the gas and the dust. And they're both shown here for sort of a solar type, like solar nebula type disk, compared to what you would expect if you had a solar uh, gas and solid composition of these ratios. The main thing I want to draw your attention to is that you can, this kind of freeze out pattern in disks uh, can really elevate your carbon to oxygen ratio and therefore result in um, you forming planets that has a high carbon to oxygen ratio in their atmospheres. But it has a limit. It really can't raise your carbon to oxygen ratio above unity, at least not by, by very much. But it's then um, interesting to, to ask, do we see evidence of this in disks? Do we see this high carbon to oxygen uh, gas phase ratios? We can't um, see all of these carriers that we would like to see. They just don't have uh, strong lines uh, at ALMA wavelengths. But what we can do is use tracers of the overall gas phase, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen budgets that do have that are accessible to us uh, with ALMA. And this is exactly what we have done. Uh, among the uh, maps and lines, we have uh, lines that um, do depend only on the carbon. Basically, well, there's some complications, but mainly it de depends on the amount of carbon you have in the gas phase, as well as other molecular lines that depend both on carbon and oxygen. So you can imagine that the ratio of something like C2H to CO is going to go up as your C2O ratio uh, increases. And uh, this is something that we looked at uh, within MAPS. We tried to model this C2H over CO ratio uh, in, um, in the disks. And uh, what Arthur Bosman found uh, is that you need a very high C C2O ratio, carbon to oxygen ratio to match the data. So it's shown here, uh, the black curves shows the, show the derived this case, the C2H column densities, or they taken into account this, the CO data um, for three of the disks. And then the yellow, orange, and purple lines show the predicted uh, C2H column densities assuming different carbon to oxygen ratios. And the orange one is the, is the unity. So that was the maximum we expected to see from this preset. But what you're seeing is that for most of the disk, it seems like you require a much higher carbon to oxygen ratio than that. And this might suggest that we should expect to see uh, planetary envelopes that are very with very elevated carbon to oxygen ratios. Uh, whether we will see them, if we do see them, we should probably expect them to be pretty formed pretty far out in these disks. That seems to be where we have the most extreme. Uh, values. And it will for sure be very interesting to see um, if we end up discovering uh, any of those. This high carbon to oxygen ratio also have implications for the kind of organic chemistry that you would expect to see, to see in disks. And that brings me to the final maps uh, question that I want to talk about, which uh, are what are the organics like uh, in these disks? Uh, now, the organic uh, inventory of disks uh, is something that people had addressed before MAPS. What's going to be new is that we have now more data on what it's like in the most re on the most relevant, relevant scales uh, for planet formation. Generally, when we look at organic inventories in disks, 
these are the kind of molecules that we find. So in, in these images of molecules, gray is carbon, uh, red is oxygen, blue is nitrogen, and yellow is sulfur. The main thing I want you to draw your attention to is that we don't have that many molecules with oxygen in them. Uh, that overall, the organic chemistry that's visible to us is in the gas phase in discs and probably actually forming in discs, um, seems to be oxygen poor and really dominated by carbon and nitrogen. The reason for this is the same uh, of that that we just saw with the, in the case of the high abundances of C2H, we think the gas is very carbon rich and very oxygen poor in these discs. Out of these organic molecules, this blue family of so-called nitriles is the one that's the prebiotically most interesting. There are several scenarios for how life might, ha might have originated here on Earth, uh, but most of them uh, make use of hydrogen cyanide or related molecules, so the smallest of nitriles. And if you do have this hydrogen cyanide, you have some water access to UV light and maybe something like H2S. Uh, it's actually quite easy to form uh, most of the molecules that we think about as essential for life here on Earth, which might suggest that uh, the building blocks that we have uh, of life here on Earth might actually be the building blocks of life on many other planets as well. This is, of course, a big speculation, but I think it's an very interesting hypothesis, it actually hypothesis that really gives us something uh, to look for when one day we'll be able to really characterize potentially habitable uh, planets. Within maps, uh, we did see a lot of hydrogen cyanide, so the smallest of nitriles. Um, it was actually one of the molecules that show the most structure. Uh, so we have a lot of substructure, a lot of rings and gaps in hydrogen cyanide. This means that it's very unevenly distributed in the gas. So planets forming at different radii uh, would have um, very different access to hydrogen cyanide during the formation stage. But if we focus at the inner, in the inner part of the disk, uh, where we think that most of the plant formation is happening, so it's in a scale smaller than the solar system, then a somewhat more consistent picture emerges. Uh, so what we... Uh, Oh, I should say one more thing that actually we, we also know that uh, a lot of the hydrogen cyanide we are seeing, at least in the inner parts of the disks, seem to, the emission seems to be coming from close to the mid plane where planets are forming. So we're seeing the right scales both radially and vertically when we're looking uh, for this emission. But when we are um, just com combining like, the information we have about hydrogen cyanide and inner 50 AU of our disks, as uh, so said, we do get a rather consistent picture. Uh, so what's shown here is our hydrogen cyanide abundances compared to our estimated water abundances. This comes from models. So they are at best order of magnitude estimates. Uh, but we see that overall uh, we have uh, in four out of five disks uh, about a percent or so hydrogen cyanide compared to water. This is very similar to what we find in comets in the solar system, which is shown here with the gray overlay. So in most comets, you have somewhere between 0.1 and 1% of hydrogen cyanide compared to water, uh, suggesting that the environment within which other uh, planetary systems are currently uh, assembling might not have been that different uh, compared to our own solar nebula. Uh, the, What's also exciting about uh, these MAPS disks is that we don't just have this simple nitrile, HCN. We also have a couple of more complex ones, in particular HC3N and CH3CN, or acetonitrile, which tells you that this nitrile chemistry is already off, uh, becoming quite complex by the time that plant formation, or like by the time so atmospheres of planets, for example, are assembling. And that planets really are forming uh, in a chemically very rich environment, not just because of inheritance, but also because of this in situ production uh, of this kind of nitrile, uh, complex, simple and complex nitriles. So if we return to our sort of inheritance uh, plus in situ uh, 
cartoon, what we have is that disks form already inheriting this very rich chemistry. They have you know, the volatile body that is already set, uh, some initial organic building blocks is set, even some of the more complex organic chemistry already comes, um, that comes before planets start even forming. But also during plant formation, you have this new generation of organic molecules forming, and it seems like the high carbon to oxygen ratio in this really favors the formation of the prebiotically most interesting molecules in my estimation, which are these uh, nitriles. This is all I want to say about observations, but this is not where you want to stop if you want to try to understand the chemistry of plant formation. Since in the end, all observations can give is really a snapshot of sort of a limited snapshot of the chemistry that's going on right now in the disks that you're observing. It doesn't directly tell you where these molecules come from or where they're going. So I do you want to spend just a couple of minutes saying something about how you can start addressing where these molecules come from, focusing on this larger nitrile shown here, the acetone nitrile. And one of the ways you can try to answer that question is to uh, attempt to recreate some of the disk chemistry in the lab and see if some formation theories that you have for these molecules, if they work when you actually do experiments. So this is what the kind of instrument uh, looks like uh, that uh, we work with uh, in my lab where you try to um, build up the kind of thin ices that we think exist on interstellar grains and then expose them to the kind of en the same kind of energy sources that you do have in disks and then follow the chemistry of these interstellar ice as a stimulants. What's so powerful about these experiments is that we can do what we cannot do in space. Uh, it is that we can control what kind of ice we have we can manipulate this ice in very controlled ways with electrons or UV photons or heat. And then we can look in great detail on how this input of energy changes the balance between solids and gas, uh, between the, of how it uh, changes the structure of the ice, as well as how it changes the chemical composition of the ice. And one idea that we have of how maybe this acetone nitrile could be forming uh, in disks is that you start out with uh, the, what we think of as major carriers of carbon and nitrogen in the pre-stellar phase. There's ammonia and sort of simple hydrocarbons and you expose them uh, to UV. And this is all work uh, by a former undergraduate in my lab, uh, Alessandra Kanta. Uh, and this work is currently under uh, review. So she ran a large number of experiments mixing ammonia and hydrocarbon ice, exposing it to UV, and then seeing how much of acetonitrile and other prebiotically interesting products that would form. What she found is that uh, when you start with the least saturated, that is C2H2 or acetylene uh, ice mixtures, you do actually form quite a lot of acetonitrile. That's what you see in the lower left uh, panel. Um, but what you form even more of in all of the experiments is a so-called imine. You can think about an imine as something in between an amine, so ammonia is the smallest amine, where you have this NH uh, kind, of, kind of bond, and a, and a nitrile where you just have the CN and there are no hydrogens uh, bonding to the, to the nitrogen anymore. And this kind of ratio between the imine and the nitrile together with other sort of particular results of the experiments allowed Alessandra to figure out the formation pathways and this how you go from these initial ice mixtures to the final products. And the most important result is that to form the acetone nitrile through this pathway, you always have to go through the imine. And that means that you should have more of the imine around than the acetone nitrile. We haven't looked for this imine in disks, uh, but in related sources uh, where people have looked for it, they haven't seen very much. Uh, so that would suggest that this is not the major production pathway of acetonitrile, but it would be good to have a look for this imine and confirm it. And in the meantime, we have some other ideas on how you could potentially be forming this acetonitrile uh, in disks. <laughs> 
And uh, that brings me back to this, this picture of, um, of what is setting the chemical environment of this. Uh, this really ends the section on the chemistry of plant formation. But before ending the presentation, I do just want to draw your attention to you that there are many more things you can do with data uh, of the quality that, that, you get, uh, that you get with Alma on molecules and disks. Uh, the very detailed uh, spectral resolution, uh, as well as spatial resolution, really allows you to look at the dynamics of disks. So these GIFs are just going to step through different velocity channels, allowing you to see the emission coming from both different spatial parts of the disks, as well as different uh, velocities. And you can imagine that when you do this uh, for different molecules, this really going to allow you to trace what the gas is doing at different radii, at different heights in terms of their dynamics. This is showing it for 12CO, which is the brightest line, so where you can see uh, the most structure. But you can do similar things for other molecular lines as well, uh, which has the advantage of that we think different molecular lines, or we actually see that different molecular lines come from different parts of the disk. You can also use the molecular line emission that we see to trace um, what's going on dynamically on larger scales uh, in these disks. So this is work by Jian Huang, uh, who has, has really been looking at uh, the CO emission that's coming from scales that are larger than we typically think about uh, as the protoplanetary disk. And it's finding that it's quite common that what you think about as isolated plant forming disks is actually still dynamically and perhaps chemically attached to their natal cloud, which might lead to uh, the inflow of sort of a chemically younger gas onto the disk uh, as plants are still forming. So this is really interesting uh, avenue uh, to try to, to pursue further. Uh, but with that, I would just like to summarize uh, that when we think about the chemical environments within which planets form and how planets get their compositions, including their potential to become habitable planets, uh, we need to think not just about their, their disk environment, but also about everything that went before it. Uh, in the disks, uh, we do see the basic building blocks, so sort of classical origins of life chemistry. Uh, it's common, uh, it's widely distributed, and it seems to be there at abundances quite similar to the solar nebula. But uh, molecular line observations of these disks also give us access to many other things than sort of organic composition, uh, including the elemental composition, ionization, uh, dynamics, um, the amount of photons you have around and, and so on. Uh, so for anyone who's interested in any of those things, I can just encourage you uh, to get into, uh, to have a look at the data and see if any of it uh, is useful for the kind of work that you do. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my presentation and I'd be happy uh, to take any questions. Thank you very much, Karen, for this uh, really nice talk. Cool very interesting science and exciting observations. So for the question, two options, either you can type your question in the Q&A section, or you can also raise your virtual hand. And if so if you're a panelist, you can uh, directly speak. If you're an attendee, then uh, you can raise your hand and we can allow you to speak. So to begin with, we have two questions in the Q&A section from Maitreyi Bose, who says, thanks for a great talk. I have two questions. One, when studying vertical chemical structures, how does one correct for orientation of the disk or is that unimportant? Would it be better to compute the relative ratios of isotopal loads and then study the slice data? And then the second question is, can you talk about the ICE experiments that you are doing with your team on sulfur bearing compounds? Yeah, no, thank you for those questions. Um, so I don't know with orientation, if sort of you mean inclination of the disc, I'm gonna assume that that's uh, what, what you mean, so that's the most obvious uh, thing you do need to take into account. Uh, yes, it's really important. And it's actually, sometimes taking that into account 
is how you get the, the height of the emitting layer in the first place. And it's only if the disk is sitting at sort of favorable inclination that you actually can get the, uh, you can see the separation between the, the back and the front of the disk and therefore get this emission layer, layer structure. If the disk is like that, uh, you would not be able to do it. Um, when talking about the isotopologues, well, it's hard because the isotopologue emission is mostly, I mean, even for C80 now, and definitely for 13CO and 12CO, it's optically thick. Um, so it depends what you mean. You can try to get um, the vertical structure by looking at the, um, the temperature uh, of a molecule, which you can do either from comparing multiple lines, if the lines are optically thin or, thin or marginally optically thick, uh, or uh, if you have optically thick lines that then you can directly correlate to temperature. But then you need to first know your temperature structure. And the way we know our temperature structure is by doing this kind of vertical layer uh, analysis. So, so I would say it's uh, Richard Teague as well as uh, Charles Law and other people have written quite a lot on how you can, uh, how you can get this sort of vertical information from the disks, but taking into account their inclination is definitely important. Uh, on two, so we don't have any published results uh, on using sulfur bearing molecules uh, in the ice. We have recently started to do experiments on it, uh, though actually in our, our case, uh, it has not been to look at the sulfur chemistry directly, but rather to use sulfur bearing molecules as um, sort of co-reactants with other chemistry we're interested in. But since that is not published results, I should probably not steal my postdoc's thunder by talking too much about it. Uh, but if you're wondering why there isn't that much um, sulfur bearing sort of ice chemistry in the literature, it is because many of the sulfur bearing molecules are a little bit nasty to work with. So you have to be, you have to be careful and they tend to sort of gunk up some of the experiments, but it is definitely possible. You're seeing more and more work on it, both in our labs and in other labs. All right, we have a second question in the Q&A. So I'm gonna read it by Lisette Gavilan. Thank you for this wonderful talk. The movies of gas kinematics are amazing. Question, the low C2O ratios that enhance organic chemistry remind us of Titan's reducing atmosphere, which is rich hazes. Could we expect an efficient production of hydrocarbons in the disk as well? Could such reduced organic chemistry play an important role in planet formation? I think that's a great question. I think there's actually a lot more um, sort of potential overlap between atmospheric chemistry models and disk chemistry models than maybe we typically assume. Uh, I do think we probably have pretty efficient hydrocarbon uh, formation in these disks. Uh, it's not going to be probably exactly the same chemistry as in Titan. Uh, because we do still have a lot lower density and generally lower temperatures. So there are some formation pathways that are cut off compared to what you uh, have in Titan. So uh, I don't think we'll get to a place where we have hazes per se, but I do think you'll get some uh, pretty efficient hydrocarbon chemistry. And in some sense, I mean, the reason you have this high carbon to oxygen ratio on Titan and in these disks might be quite similar, which is that you have removed a lot of the oxygen because water has frozen out. So you have really just gotten rid of a lot of the oxygen from, from the gas and that is freeing up this carbon focused hydrocarbon and, and nitrile chemistry, just as we see on Titan. All right, uh, anyone else has a question, you can raise your hand or again, write it in the Q and A section. Uh, in the meantime, I do have one question and I was wondering how the, um, the disks that, uh, for which you presented the observation compare with the, what we think the pro, uh, our own protoplanetary disk was? It's a very good question. Um, so we purposefully picked disks that are not really normal, but rather the disks that are the biggest and brightest and therefore the easiest to characterize uh, for this sort of first study. And that should definitely be seen as a very first step, not where we actually want to end up, where we would want to end up is to have statistical information over a large number of disks uh, that get us closer to sort of the mean kind of disk uh, rather than, uh, than these 
really big ones. So that's the first thing that um, statistically speaking, probably our disk was not as massive uh, as these disks are. Um, though I think this is something we're gonna learn more about also from exoplanet studies when we find out how common having Jupiter-sized planets are in other systems since Maybe it's not something that all uh, all stars actually end up with. So we might actually have been somewhat on the more massive end, even if we were not all the way at the red extreme. The other thing that um, makes it different is that even if it was quite massive, it looks like our disk, uh, based on sort of the Kuiper belt, was truncated, let's say 50 AU or so, while these disks are not. Uh, these ones are hundreds of AU, so at least the radial distribution probably somewhat different in these disks compared to the solar system, though also with our solar system, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty what's going on sort of beyond the, the Kuiper belt. The final and maybe most important difference is that there's evidence uh, that the solar system formed uh, closer to massive stars than these disks are currently located. So these disks were all picked to be in uh, nearby, uh, star forming regions, which means that they are not in massive star forming regions. The Orion will be the closest to that one. So in addition to getting this sort of more general uh, sample of this chemistry data, we would definitely want to have some on Orion as well to see what the effect of being close to massive stars would be. Uh, one can imagine having those extra photons would actually really speed up some of the chemistry. Mm -hmm. All right, so we do have uh, one question in the in the chat, which is how much is physical process such as diffusion contribute to distribution of isotopologues of certain molecules in the disk? So I don't know about isotopologues in particular. Uh, when it comes to diffusion, um, as well as let's say, um, how, how grains uh, move through the disk, you would expect the effect to be the same for different types of top blocks. There's no reason that you would have sort of more diffusion of 13CO compared to C18O. You would expect them to be co-located. Uh, and if they are not co-located, there is more chemical effects rather than these sort of diffusion kind of effects. But more generally, diffusion, um, we do expect, as, as well as grain transport, we do expect that to really change the chemistry. So when we're thinking about sort of the, the overall chemical landscape, it is really important both to take into account diffusion and the, therefore know what the turbulence of these disks uh, is like, um, as well as to understand how much grain growth and uh, sort of grain transport, how much uh, that is going on. Because that is that can really operate on, on the same time scales at, as the chemistry and therefore really change things around compared to what you would expect from a passive disk. All right, other questions for Karin? If not, I had a quick follow-up on, on my question actually, which was uh, whether we, we can expect to observe a smaller disk with, with ALMA just uh, having better uh, signal treatments or whether it would require uh, like more advanced uh, instruments? Um, so it's a sort of yes and no, it's complicated kind of question. Uh, if the disks are smaller, just like radially smaller, we could see them in the same, with, in the same time as we did maps. So with maps, we spent uh, around 25 hours per disk but that was in four different settings. So you could do sort of one setting in depth in about five hours or so to get the same um, sensitivity as with maps, the same spatial resolution. And our spatial resolution was down towards 1015 AU. So you could definitely do a much smaller disk um, if it has the same intensity on those scales as we did here. Uh, disks that have much weaker emission uh, are gonna be possible, but are gonna be very time consuming. Uh, to do to do with Alma. So you're probably not going to do that many of them. I, mean, I guess like if you like with the same kind of sensitivity and like level of detail, that would probably be at most tens of them. You're not going to go to hundreds 
uh, of them. But it might just be that many of the discs that to as a sort of first look, uh, look like they are fainter are actually just smaller. So that zooming in on them is not gonna in some sense cost you anything uh, or it's gonna cost you the same as uh, zooming in on the larger disks. And in that case, we should be fine. And I think one of the important things is actually to figure that out. All right, yeah, thank you. So I guess if we have no further question, let's uh, thank uh, Karen again. And again, I'm clapping on behalf of the, of the audience. And with that, uh, we'll close the seminar. Um, next seminar is going to be in one month because in two weeks there's a LPSC upcoming. So in one month, we will have a seminar by Fabrice Gaillard. Thank you again, Karen, and have a good evening. Thank you.